All right, y'all. I got my shoulder pads in place and I am ready to talk about nonverbal delivery. So let's start by thinking about what makes for a bad presentation. Maybe it's a monotone speaker or a lack of connection between the audience. Um, or have you seen a speech where all the gestures and movements just looked super robotic and rehearsed? I always think it's fun to make a list of my public speaking pet peeves and then do every single thing possible to avoid those when it's my turn to speak. No promises. So for me, it is in fact a monotone speaker, the Ferris Bueller teacher, played by actor Ben Stein, something right along those lines. In contrast, you could also make a list of qualities for what you would say make for a good speech delivery. And I have a feeling that you've probably watched more speeches than we could even count, or maybe even that we can recollect. Maybe it's a speaker who uses really engaging gestures or movement, one who has energy and showcases their passion, dynamism, or even really awesome tech integration. And if you're drawing a blank during this brainstorming activity, that's totally fine. We often take for granted the practice that it takes for really good public speakers um, to get good at their craft. And instead, we chalk up really good speaking to someone's natural ability or charisma, saying that they maybe were just born that way or perhaps even an extrovert. But there's a lot more to being a good speaker and delivering a good speech than simply charisma or natural ability. There are, for example, strategic pauses that you can use for effect. You like that one? Okay, how about a speaker that uses real dynamic movements or gestures to keep things kind of always going and flowing? Or have you ever watched a speech or even a performance where the passion and the energy behind the speaker or performer was just palpable? If you take a look at the final page of this week's module, you will see lots of examples of speeches showcasing these delivery skills and even more. It's kind of a grab bag of sorts list of speeches, um, but I definitely suggest choosing one to watch and making a short list of the qualities that you admire, as well as those delivery qualities that you think are distracting. A short list of nonverbal delivery skills then include things like volume, pitch, rate, strategic pauses, those that I mentioned before. Also tone, or what you might see referred to as vocal variety or even emotionality. Pronunciation, movement and gestures, and of course, eye contact. So let's pause on the pause. Did you know that you can use pauses or even silence to your advantage? One way would be to use a pause in order to create that dramatic effect as I modeled just moments ago. But in doing so, the goal would be to elicit curiosity, pause for questions, maybe look out at the audience and gauge their reactions to a particular claim, giving them time to think and contemplate. You could simply pause just to break up a monotonous tone or the rate of speech. Now, what about tone? The tone of your voice should match the content of your speech. Have you ever heard someone say something that should be sad, but all their nonverbal communication indicated otherwise? Maybe their voice, their facial expression, their gestures just didn't seem sad? Well, that's really confusing as a listener and oftentimes perceived as inauthentic. Audience members pay more attention to the way things are said than the words themselves. In fact, communication researchers estimate that somewhere between 70 and 90% of all of our communication occurs non-verbally. So work with your tone. Be sure to avoid giving a monotone speech by practicing vocal variants as often as you can. So here's an example. 
of practicing your tone. If you were to give a speech about the greatest adventure that you ever took, you could showcase your excitement by adding emotionality in your voice. You could also do so with volume and rate. For example, slow your rate and lower your voice to a whisper when you want to get our attention or um, to build excitement, but then shout and speed up when you really want us to listen. Now let's talk a little bit about movement and gestures. One reason I would tend to discourage public speaking from behind a podium in class is because um, it doesn't allow for much movement or natural gestures to be seen by the audience. Lucky for you, you get to present your speech from the comfort of your own home, maybe an office, wherever you decide. And my guess is you don't have a podium, and that's a good thing. So be sure not to stand behind a table or a desk and instead use the space around you to your fullest advantage. One thing audiences have reported is that they actually pay greater attention to speakers when they move. And a great way that you can plan this is to take two or three steps in any direction, moving closer to your audience members if you want to indicate importance or farther away when summarizing content, moving to a new spot for each new main point, or even um, using your body to create a circle and to come full circle when it's time to give the conclusion. Now, I know that there may be some movement restrictions when it comes to recording your own speeches and that we all have differing abilities. So do your best when it comes to movement and gestures to use all the space that you can. A stagnant speech speaker can make for a stagnant speech. That said, also know that I am 100% willing to work with anybody's accommodations as needed. Let's move on to eye contact, which is a bit trickier, especially in an online class. Since I won't be able to see your direct eye contact with your audience members very easily, I'll be looking for ways that you engage with your audience by looking at them, toward them in their direction, maybe even responding to their feedback non-verbally, whether they or you are nodding along or even interacting in subtle ways. And this is true even if your audience isn't live, but you're interacting with a fake audience or a digital one. Because eye contact plays a really big role in speaker credibility, but we also understand that it can be challenging or even scary to engage in. I always suggest making eye contact for at least three seconds with different audience members, but then shifting your eyes to a new audience member or space in the room Looking at someone's forehead can also give them the impression that you're making eye contact with them, but make the speaker feel way more comfortable by avoiding that direct eye contact. So now it's time to practice. This week's discussion board asks you to read a short passage from a children's story out loud, and I really hope you take advantage of that. But if you don't have one sitting around or you simply don't like the activity, another option is for you to tell us, your audience, a short like one minute, scary story. And this can be either a true scary story or one that you've made up. In this exercise, you're going to look to practice speech rate or pace and volume, as well as tone. First, think of a scary story you could tell. Then practice telling it, unrecorded and out loud. Think about how you naturally used your voice to create suspense, fear, if you lowered your voice, or raised the volume at certain parts, why you may be slowed down or sped up, and at what points of the story you did so. As you practice retelling your story a second time, now add three strategic pauses. Be sure that you're varying your tone on either side of the pause so that the pause doesn't seem awkward or choppy, but well-placed and paced. And lastly, have fun. I know this activity is silly, but again, it's just about practicing. We are, in fact, an online workshop. I hope that was helpful. Take care.